Hi, I'm Michelle Shelfont, psychotherapist, holistic life coach, and human, just like you, learning to navigate life's challenges. With over 25 years experience, I teach people how to get healthy using the adult chair model. The adult chair model is where simple psychology meets grounded spirituality, and it teaches us how to become healthy adults. From anxiety and depression to codependency and relationship issues, you can use the adult chair for just about anything. Each week, I share practical tips, tools, and advice from myself and a wide range of experts on how to get unstuck, how to live authentically, and how to truly love yourself all while sitting in your adult chair. Welcome to the Adult Chair Podcast. So welcome to the Adult Chair Podcast, Matt Prey. Thank you so much. I'm really grateful to be here, Michelle. Yeah, it's so, so great to have you. And you and I were just chit-chatting about how um, I love your philosophy, your philosophy about relationships is very in line with the adult chair model. And I think that the people that listen to the show are really going to love what you have to say today. It's a lot about, as you say, um, the importance of safety and trust. That's, I don't think anything matters more than no. trust specifically, but I find safety to go hand in hand with that, meaning the absence of trust results in a loss of safety. And then my belief is that mammals, people will seek safety in the absence of it. And, and I apply that to relationships as much as, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Yeah. So we've got a lot to talk about. Relationships, I think, are definitely a hot topic on the Adult Chair podcast, no doubt about it. Um, but I would love to let people know about your story. Like how did, what, tell us about your story. You have a really fascinating story and um, yeah, and how this book came to be. So start well, us you. out. Yeah, thank you. I, <laughs> I, I don't know. It's, it, it, it seems so regular to me, but, but perhaps what I did after my marriage ended is the thing that's unusual. Um, I perceive myself to be like regular guy. And I know that that's not fair because we have a lot of like diversity in this world. And I don't mean, I, I mean, I, I perceive myself to be like the statistical norm. I don't know that that's true, but I think it is mm -hmm. based on feedback over the last nine years of this work and, and, and writing for public consumption. But my marriage ended and it was really unpleasant in 2013. And we'd been married for 12 years. Mm -hmm. And at the time, I really thought that I was sort of being treated unfairly or thought of unfairly. I thought I wasn't like, I thought she was misinterpreting my intention or overreacting to the things that I did. That was just my default sort of belief mm -hmm. about how she was behaving in the relationship. And I really thought the problems we had were less about anything I was doing and more about how she was interpreting it. And right she left and it was the most difficult thing personally that I'd ever encountered in my life. It was my first real taste of, you know, I use words like brokenness, darkness. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. But, but it, you know, perhaps, <clears throat> perhaps it could be trauma. And I, I don't like saying that word because of the hardships other people have endured mm -hmm. that I think most of us would agree are infinitely more traumatic than divorce. So I'm not trying to compare those, but relative to my life, I believe it was the most traumatic experience and you can only know what you know. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, wow, this is really hard. And so it I was shocking. Like when she said, I want to leave or I want a divorce and left. No, what was shocking was like the physical experience inside my head and chest after it happened, because I stayed in the guest room for Maybe I should back up a minute. Yeah, please. We lost her father. Oh. A couple of years before our marriage ended and it was awful. It was out of nowhere, mm -hmm. right? And as you well know, uh, traumatic events like that can sort of like be the straw that broke the camel's back. But I didn't, yeah. I didn't know things like that back then. Um, and I thought of my wife's inability, <laughs> sounds so horrible and I apologize to every person who's lost somebody or has suffered from someone like me in the past, truly. I thought she was allowing her grief to like usurp the importance of our marriage and family. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean that right away, but I mean that like in month 10 or 11 or 12, 
And she was so different. She seemed so different to me, not the woman that, you know, I'd married. I had just no respect, no understanding of what, what she was going through and, and how I'd contribute to it leading up to that. Yeah. And so my, I really believed I was like something of a victim in this, that I was being treated unfairly, that it was a decent guy and that she was acting like I wasn't. And I'm like, mm-hmm. I'm the same person that you said I do with, you know, nine years ago that you got together with 12 years ago. I mm-hmm. don't understand this. And so I was really angry when she left and I felt something akin to betrayal. And I, I made it all about me as Mm -hmm. so many people do. Mm -hmm. Um, And, but, but the beautiful thing that happened was I started writing about it for public consumption. The story that I tell in the book is that I drank a little bit too much one night, a few months after my divorce and I was really miserable. And I called a phone in therapist courtesy of my company's HR department back then. And as the Only time I'd ever had like an individual therapy session, which I probably could use a heck of a lot more of and certainly could have back then. Mm -hmm. And she just said, you're a writer. So why don't you start writing this stuff down? And I think the adult thing to do is get like a private journal and write and do that work. And there's Mm -hmm. a lot of value in it. But because I'm me and a little bit juvenile, I put it on the internet. One thing led to another. And the beautiful thing that occurred, the miracle that I couldn't have seen coming was the feedback that I started to get when I was telling these stories, particularly, particularly when I started to get a little taste of humility and start to ask questions. You know, I healed a tiny bit, tiny bit as time and space does. Mm -hmm. And I started saying, well, what might I have been able to understand or do differently that would have mathematically resulted in like my, a different outcome. And that's when like the real work began. And that's when people started writing back and saying, wow, Matt, like this is exactly how it looks and feels and sounds in their relationship. And they really appreciated me sort of like playing out. I I would write the truest stories I knew how to tell about what I believed and what I felt uh, in a fight in the kitchen or, you know, in some post-divorce disagreement with my ex-wife, anything. And, And there's so much power in that I'm not alone experience that I'm not the only one that feels this way. And I've experienced the before in music and film and books. And Mm -hmm. it is, it is so powerful. And the fact that I was now somehow part of a chain of events that were helping other people have that moment really motivated me to get serious about not being some jerk that just was like, you know, being a cliche, being like the divorced guy that was like blaming everyone else, but himself for how bad he felt and trying to write like sardonic dark comedy stories about it, which was how the blog originally started. And it really turned into this serious mission to try to do something positive in the world from a relationship wow. standpoint. And it had to begin with me understanding what I'd done or not done that I should have. And I believe over these nine years that I've gotten some clarity about what some of those things are. So you start, so I'm trying to, I'm thinking back about when you change, like, so you're putting out there really you know, I'm a victim. This is what my wife did. This is why it ended all this. It, it, it probably and, wasn't as awful as it sounds, but, but thematically, that was yeah. certainly how I felt on the inside when this yeah. was all starting. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm sure the ego was bruised, you know, like, oh my gosh, my wife left. This is crazy. Um, she's the one that changed. But mm-hmm. what I hear is that you, um, you, something happened to kind of humble you. Based I, on feedback you were getting from people? Is that I, what happened? I, I, I can't remember that part of it. I, I think truly I might've chose decency all on my own. I don't want to like be patting myself on the back here. Mm-hmm. I don't, but, but I mean, that's, that's when like healing truly began. When mm. I took ownership and responsibility for my lot in life, when I, when I realized that the math was where I was today was the sum of my decision-making up to that point. Mm -hmm. Frankly, even if, even if my wife was somehow this like not great person who did a bunch of awful things to me, Mm -hmm. I was still responsible. I was still responsible for the choices I'd made. So like Mm -hmm. we have to be responsible even when we choose an unhealthy or toxic partner to a certain extent. I don't mean to victim blame for people who deal with abuse and negative. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. Yeah. It's, it's just about owning battle. your story, owning your choice, yes. even if it's a horrible one. Like you said, I'm not a good uh, people that listen to me. know. like if you're in an abusive relationship, leave, like there is no, let's try to no leave, but we got to take responsibility. So I'm, that's like powerful. That's probably where everything, what caused that? 
I, I don't, don't know. Maybe, know. Maybe books. Yeah. Books might be my best guess. Books and articles and yeah. conversations with friends, particularly female friends who I don't want to make it so like gender specific because that's not fair because it's not always true. Yeah. But, but my female friends, I think particularly had a much higher caliber of relational skills than my male friends did. And so talking to them, particularly the married ones, would have unearthed, you know, nuanced pieces of information and insight that I didn't possess at the time. And now because it's been nine years and I live and breathe this conversation all the time, I, I, I might be conflating things and misremembering. But, but that's my best guess. Some yeah. combination of books, articles, my memories, yeah. And I, and I truly, the one thing I will say in, in my, in my defense, always, I really have always tried to be decent. Mm. You know I mean? That's true. Mm -hmm. And that, that was actually the great, the great miscalculation in my relationship. Mm. This idea that because I, I, I was always trying to be decent and never cause harm, that she should somehow never feel hurt or betrayed or any of the things people feel in their relationships in which trust is slowly eroding. Safety is slowly yeah. dissipating. Um, I, I had no frame of reference or respect for that idea at the time. And it's the greatest discovery of my life. It's the most important thing I've ever learned. Yeah. Cause your book is very good. I have to say, I really, really, really enjoyed it. Um, so you talk about that. We accidentally damage our relationships via habits that we honestly don't know are harmful. This is how good people end up being bad spouses. Talk a little bit more about that. As sort of, I just implied, I, when you think you're a good person, yeah, it's so easy to not accept responsibility for harm that's being experienced by someone else. So I was constantly defensive, constantly like defending myself against what felt like an unfair attack. And I just think that's a really unuseful way to think about it. Yeah. And in the context of the coaching work that I try to do today, I try to keep things really, really simple. And I, I focus on two things that I call habits. I don't know that they're technically habits, but I think thinking about them as habits is the helpful way because I don't want particularly the men that I'm working with to feel judged, to feel as if I'm saying they are like lack character or, or decency or that they're broken and need fixed or that they need my help somehow. That's awful. Mm -hmm. I don't. I suggest that good people have habits, things they do on autopilot in their blind spots, mm -hmm. and then they fail to even see because it's invisible to them some of these things that are inadvertently causing harm. I believe that's the story of how so many good people have unhealthy relationships, usually not overnight, right? It builds up over five, Always. 10, 15 years. It's the yes. slow accumulation of trust erosions. And I feel like so many people struggle to put their finger on what's happening. Yeah. And I, it, it, to me, it's because, because it presents so small in an isolated moment. And we need to learn how to think of these small moments as like this, systematic or systemic problem, so to speak, that if we don't like nip in the bud, not, not dissimilar from smoking or unhealthy eating habits that will result in potential, you know, negative health consequences down the road. I, I think it's the same, I think it's the same sort of problem. You know, I think about this, I'd like your opinion on this, um, just in doing your research and all your own work on this and working, you said you work, do you work mostly with men? Yes. Okay. I, my audience, I think is predominantly female as is just, they digest relationship content at a much higher rate, sadly than men do. But the guys, the guys tend to like hire me to be, to Good. work in like a coaching capacity. Men, we all need somebody. So I love this, but it seems to me in working with people for over 25 years, that the problem is in relationships, and we can talk about romantic relationships, marriages, partnerships, but also like, I don't care if it's siblings, friends, uh, pro workers, it doesn't matter to me. Right. The problem that we have is that humans in general, we don't know how to have honest communication and we don't know how to have the, what I would call the tough conversations. So for example, you just use this example of something very small happens, you know, your wife said whatever to you. And typically what we do is we sweep it under the carpet or we get triggered. We say something snappy and then we go on but there's no talking about it. There's no repair. That's right. There's no repair. So it starts to erode even a little bit and then a little bit more and a little bit more. And all of a sudden, you know, X number of years later is when 
your partner comes to you and goes, I want a divorce. I want to end this relationship. And you're like, wait, what, what, what are you talking about? Well, I'm talking about, I'm over this. I can't stand all these years that you did this and that. And it's like, you never told me, right? Cause we don't know how to have the conversations. So what do you, do you agree, disagree? Tell me I what you think about strongly that. Strongly agree with everything that you just said the way that I talk about it is again, in this framework of we have, we have habits. And so yes. the way that I believe this occurs, the way I believe these, these trust erosion paper cuts is how I think about them. This mm -hmm. accumulation of paper cuts causes the eventual bleed out that ends us is to me, a useful way to imagine it. And I want to prevent the paper cuts so that the bleed out never occurs in the first place. Maybe a more precise way to talk about it is simply to maintain the requisite amount of trust in the relationship in order for it to be healthy, rather than erode it to the point of when some outside traumatic event, like God forbid, the loss of a loved one happens, yeah. and then that can, that can shatter us and break our relationships. But in my coaching work, I focus on two habits. And the first one is how I'd answer what you just described. Mm -hmm. And it is about validating, even when we disagree. Mm -hmm. And please stop me. This is your show. Stop no. me. Anytime this like, this takes on too long, but I'll, I'll be as brief as I can. No, I, go. I say this to every guy that I work with. I, 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 this is the thing I call the invalidation triple threat. I believe we routinely invalidate people in three very specific but distinct ways when we disagree with them. And that this almost never harms our relationships outside of marriage. So it's so easy to write off as just harmless disagreement with the yeah. person that you love because this doesn't affect your best friend relationship necessarily or the one with your dad or your brother or your coworker or whoever, but it will absolutely over time destroy trust with the person that you share space with, mm -hmm. children with, money with, have promised the love like all the days of your life. I, I think it'll harm other relationships too, but it's just marriage particularly or, or, or committed romantic relationships are so, so sensitive to this dynamic. And what that looked like in my life and what I believe it looks like in virtually everybody's relationships, unless they have this on lockdown is my wife comes to me to communicate that something's wrong, that she feels bad about something. And I think it's useful to think of it as being painful because, mm -hmm. because yeah. I'm sympathetic to the notion of somebody hurting. So it can, but it can be anger. It can be fear. And I mean, people hurt and they come and they just want to say, Hey, this thing happened and it hurt me. Yeah. My wife would say that. So version one of invalidating her when I disagreed, because sometimes I understood. And I think I showed up well when I did, when I like agreed with what she thought happened. But so often I didn't agree with what she believed happened. And so I'd try to correct her. I'd be like, wait a minute, mm -hmm. that's not what happened. I'd try to reframe it. The math result of that conversation is your feelings don't matter because they're based on something that isn't real, that isn't true. So I'm trying to like correct her intellectual experience with what happened, version one. Mm -hmm. Version two, is just the opposite. This time I agree with what she says happened. Hey, Matt, I feel bad because this thing happened. And I agree that the thing happened, but I disagree that her emotional reaction to it is fair or appropriate. So this time I'm trying to correct her feelings. Mm -hmm. This time I'm, I'm judging her feelings to be wrong somehow or unfair. And I try to tell her so. Believing I can solve the problem by her realizing that she's like overreacting to it is really, really foolish. Uh, version three, and, and again, every time we do this, and we do this all the time, if we're not being our best selves, it erodes trust. And, and this will end, this is just my strong belief that this accumulated over a decade ends you. And you don't see it coming because of how small each of these isolated incidents present. So you're never scared enough to like course correct along the way. I believe that's the story of why the divorce rate is what it is, why the dating relationship breakup rate is what it is. Version three, I think is the worst one uh, in the context of trust erosion. It's defensiveness. Wife comes to me and says, Matt, I hurt because you did this or you didn't do this and you should have. You know, you, you essentially like broke a promise to me or you did something harmful. And I'm like, wait a minute, let me explain. <laughs> like, if you understand like why I did that or, or what I believed at the time, you won't be mad at me anymore. And that was like my way of, way of solving the problem. And I, I believe defensiveness erodes trust, not just in the, invalidation way, which it does, it invalidates the emotional experience she's having in real time. But it also, I think, implies that we'll do it again. When we're like doubling down on a behavior that she's raising her hand and saying, hey, Matt, this hurts. Mm -hmm. And then I defend it as this like really intelligent thing I should have been doing. I believe she has every reason to think I might do it next week, next month, next year. And then she has to think, 
wow, the person that promised to love me forever not only dismisses this pain that I'm feeling and trying to help him understand and like recruit him to help me solve this so that we don't hurt and have the same problem continue in the future, but he's not only is he dismissing it, minimizing my feelings and all of these other things, but he's implying that he's going to do this potentially forever. And how can a human trust someone or feel safe with someone where the implication is that I will always, and this is exactly what I implied in my invalidation habit with my wife, mm. that whenever I disagreed with her, mm -hmm. I would always choose what I believed, what I felt, or what my like intentions were in the context of defensiveness. Yeah. I will always choose those things over her. My, mm. my beliefs and feelings will always trump yours mm -hmm. whenever we don't see eye to eye on an issue. And so my wife realized if Matt doesn't agree with me, I have to subject myself to not being heard, to not being understood, to being dismissed as something he values less than himself. I didn't know how to see it that way back when I was having these arguments in the kitchen with her, but I know very clearly how to see it now. And I think I recognize the inherent danger and the slow buildup of erosion that occurs when we do this. And very good people who really truly love each other can do this to one another. And this isn't exclusively a male problem. I just no, think, I agree. I think statistically, if we like lined up all the humans, more men would do this than women in, in hetero relationships. Yeah. Yep. I agree. I love that. And I think you're spot on. Good. Honestly, Good. I really do think you're spot on and it, and it really does damage relationships when, and I think that women do it too. Absolutely. It's not just a male thing, but I would, I would agree. Like women are better with emotions in general. Again, this is not like, you know, all the time, black and white kind of thing, but it's like, yeah. Um, women in general are better with emotions. We're better with tuning in and empathy. So you talk some about empathy and you say, it's the number one skill we need to succeed in relationships. When we love people, we must honor their experiences, their reality to connect with them on an emotionally healthy level. hundred percent agree. I talked about how dark and painful the early days of divorce were and I needed it. And, and, and I promise you, it's not hyperbolic. When I write the words, I kind of wanted to die. Mm -hmm. I, I had never experienced a level of pain and discomfort mentally, emotionally, like, like a crisis of self. I'd never experienced anything like that before. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, you're, you're scared that it's never going to go away. You're like, you're like, what if this is my life now? What if, what if my daily experience is this? And, and I had real questions about how long I would want to be around if, if every moment of my life had a lot of pain attached to it. Mm. And, and when I realized what I was thinking through, I, I was not a threat, I don't believe, to ever like self-harm, but, but I finally could empathize, finally, with somebody, because I always, I always thought that was so silly, that I always thought it was so ridiculous that people would like hurt themselves or end their lives. It seemed so tragic and senseless to me. Mm -hmm. And then I had this moment where I'm like, goodness, if they hurt every day because of the things they were experiencing, might I, you know, like, because we're more or less having the same thought process. I'm just blessed enough that I, I was able to heal with time and that, you know, I have lovely friends and family that were very supportive um, and it helps so much. And, and the writing, nothing helped more than writing yeah. these things down in real time. And, yeah. and, and learning how to take ownership. It's so empowering to realize I had so much more control over this outcome than I had originally believed. It sort of mitigates like the anger you feel and the fear of it, like a repeat scenario in the future. I, I don't feel like I have to be scared of this happening again. Hmm. But there are so many things outside of our control and that's fine, but I know that I can positively influence or at minimum not negatively influence this like safety and trust thing in relationships in my blind spots. Yeah. I don't, I don't believe I'm a threat to do that again. And I think that's really great. Um, but so very quickly, that empathy lesson, mm -hmm. I very quickly applied that to my wife within a week. I bet I said, you know what, maybe in her darkest moments in our relationship, when she felt abandoned and sitting alone on the couch, watching HGTV while I ran off to play poker or to go play a video game, just whatever. I just, yeah. all of those times she felt alone in the marriage. 
perhaps her level of pain and fear and just feeling awful inside and anxiety, insecurity felt just like I'd felt. And I'm like, mm. if she, if, if she is experiencing the same degree of like pain that I feel right now, it makes so much sense that she would want to escape and go live a life in which she didn't voluntarily subject herself to my BS and then feel those bad things. I get it. It, it, it turned what felt unfair originally into this really wise, self-respecting, self-loving thing that she did for both herself and our son. Because mm. I want her to be her best self always, for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, on my worst day, I didn't want anything bad to happen to her. Um, but, but even if I somehow was like, uh, I'm missing the word, but like ap apathetic about her, I would still want my son to have a healthy mother so that he could live the best life possible the 50% of the time that he's with her. And yeah. so it, it, those are the mental like kind of growth points. And, and I, I don't know how to really even say it. I, I don't know if that's logical or not, but I, I was sort of walk. Those are the, that's the chain of events that happened that yeah. took me from guy who perpetually invalidated to guy who developed a sense of empathy that I think is really important to have effective relational skills. It's like you had an awakening experience because of your own grief and what you had gone through is what it sounds like. Would it's embarrassing. Mean? It's selfish. I don't like that. My story is I hurt so bad that I finally started caring about other people hurting. Yeah. But if it's, if it's what woke you up, then it's, yeah. there's a positive there in my opinion. No, it, you it know, is. I mean, it's too bad. It didn't happen earlier, but it wasn't meant to happen earlier. It was meant to happen exactly when it did. So then you can turn around and get this message out to the world. So, you know, I, I don't think it, there are mistakes. That's my opinion again in the world. So the timing was perfect it, on some level. In the context level. of sitting yeah, in this Yeah, now you get to go out and teach all these people how to do this. And this is yeah. really important work that you're doing. Thank you. Um, Fine. Yeah, for sure. Um, it's just sad because I think that as little boys, as they grow up, they're not taught to sit in the field. You know, little girls are if they cry, that's okay. And then little boys is like, boys don't cry. You know, there are all those messages that are just in our society that say, boys don't cry. Boys are tough. Boys. Are, it's like every baby that's born. If you're a boy or a girl, they both cry. They both have emotions and boys somehow get walked out of it or turned out of it or tuned out of their emotions. So I love this message. Cause I think there's a, a men's movement happening right now in the world. Thank God. And it's really, really bringing men to the table, the emotional table, and really ha ha having them start to feel their emotions and be real and take responsibility and own their lives and show up in relationships in a really a much healthier way than they had before. Um, and the and it, empathy, it's the whole thing. It's like every human has the ability to have empathy. Um, so thank you for the work that you're doing. I think it's really powerful. Yeah. If I may add to what you just said about- Yeah how we inadvertently feed toxic masculinity by raising boys a mm -hmm. certain way. Again, mm -hmm. not everybody all the time, but, but too yeah. often. Yeah. I just wanted to like give a shout out to Jennifer Siebel Newsom, who the filmmaker who made The Mask You Live In in 20, it's mm -hmm. about this topic. Ooh, and so really? if there are any guys listening that haven't been exposed to like these ideas before about how young boys are raised a certain way and how that can really lead to a lot of uh, emotional and relational issues as we age and date and get married and parent children and things like that. I just think Jennifer Siebel Newsom's movie, The Mask You Live In, really like presents this so well. And it, I don't know, it, it landed who, with me and it, it was No, great. I, I, who is this? Can you say that name again? I'll put it in the show notes. Jennifer Siebel Newsom. She's actually the wife of um, and, and forgive me for anybody who has political leanings a certain way. She's the wife of Governor California Governor Gavin Newsom, but she okay. works as a documentary filmmaker. So and this is a movie, though, a, do a documentary? Yes. Love it. Okay. I'll put it in the show notes in case anybody wants to watch it. it sounds like it sounds awesome. It was to me, it was really illuminating. Yeah. Uh, and I, you know, the other word that you keep using, which I use all the time, is, and I couldn't agree with you more when you say habit. It's just a habit. I love that because we can change anything. It's a habit. Like, how are you thinking? It's a habit. How are you showing up? It's a habit. Just change it. And, and I don't mean to make things sound so trite, like it's so easy. 
it's not easy to change habits. But another thing you say is that your response patterns are habits that you can change. Forming better habits starts with self-awareness. So talk about that a little bit. Once, so the way, the way that I think about it and the way that I talk about it with clients is once you associate invalidation with the erosion of trust, then you can make the conscious decision, you know, to validate. And, 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 and for me, I mean, the, to me, the simplest piece of advice to, to the guys I'm working with is this, because they very honestly, very honestly are confused often by their wives, girlfriends, partners, reactions to yeah. the things that are happening. They are befuddled because they would never think or feel this identical thing. And they don't even know how to like, they yeah. don't even know how to like logically get to that same place. Yeah. It's just, it's not the same, but, but instead of this invalidation thing that we do, where we try to correct people's intellectual or emotional experiences, can we like get to work on understanding why that person has that, like just, it does, it's fine. It's fine that it's different, but understand it because that to me informs habit two and my coaching work, which is rooted in the idea of consideration. Mm. consideration has two like spokes one is I remember always perpetually vigilantly to calculate for how my partner will feel by the things I do or say mm. I'm not going to allow them to experience harm or disrespect or a absence of love in my blind spots oh I love that I'm going to take responsibility for that it's but your then, job yeah it's your job as the partner to really sit and protect, keep, make sure trust, safe, all of that. I love that. Sorry. So, right, it's not just the obvious things that, that you know you're not doing to cause harm. That's not enough. Yeah. There's all these accidental things that cause harm. Yes. And once yes. we learn how to validate, then we learn how to, how to consider that all the time. And so the, the, the second facet of consideration is not the, just the mental habit, but yeah. the ability to be accurate about it. Because if we're wrong, if, we're, if, we, if we don't guess correctly, about what our partner needs from us in a given moment, well, then we're still not showing up effectively for them. So it's, it's not just about remembering to consider, but to do it in a way that equals mm -hmm. truly feeling loved. Yeah. Like the other person has to experience, I feel loved when this happens. Trust increases in this relationship when you respond this way. And so that's to me, and I, and I want to be so good at consideration. You don't have to be that great at validation when you consider all the time, because there's, there's not going to be a lot of complaints about your behavior, you're right? Um, right. You, you're going to, you're going to be sort of preemptively eliminating these little pain points that happen in relationships when, when we are excellent at consideration. And so when I hear something that I'm confused by, mm -hmm. and this applies across the board, this applies yeah. to yeah. differences of opinions and like socio-political conversations yeah. and all sorts of stuff. But in the context of relationships, if I'm confused about something my partner's saying, I love the opportunity to learn this new nuanced thing. Situation X results in her feeling this bad thing. And here's why. And it's unique to her. Yeah. Everybody doesn't feel this way. I don't feel this way, but she does. Yeah. And now that I know this, Next time situation X pops up next week, next month, she can trust me. I recognize it and she can trust me to show up more effectively because I now identify the threat on her behalf, same as she does. I don't feel it, but I care enough about her to like vigilantly be on the lookout for the things she may experience as harmful, even if me myself are not harmed by that same thing. And, and even if work. you think, by the way, let me add to that, that it's ridiculous, like you said before, that she feels that way. Well, this is ridiculous. Why would you feel that way? Those opinions need to be kept to self. Like not it's our reality is our reality. We can't help. You know, it's like something's triggering us. We have an emotion that comes up. We need our person to be with us in that and not talk us out of it. Tell us we're wrong for feeling that way. Tell us we're ridiculous for feeling that way. We need someone to be there in it with us. But the other thing we need, you know, I've said this before, we can't expect our partners to be psychics, right? So also it's, if I'm, let's say if I'm in something and I need my husband to do something, whether it be sit with me, say something, sometimes I do want his opinion, 
it's my job to let him know what I need, but also he can ask me, what do you need? What do you need from me right now? I can tell you're in a bad place. What do you need from me? I need you to sit and I need you not to say anything. I remember saying that to him years ago and he goes, oh my God, you don't need me to fix it. I said, no, don't freaking fix me. Like it makes me want to slap him when he tries to fix me. For me, Michelle just needs to express, but that's what I need. Someone else needs something else. So each partnership is so unique. We have to get great at asking, what do you need? And sharing what we need. And when I, I remember working with couples and I'd be, I'd be in session with them and they'd go, whoever I'd be working with. Well, so-and-so should know what I need. We've been together for three years. We've been together for 20 years. I'm like, they should not. Absolutely not. Because they were emotional beings and we're changing all the time. So-and-so should not know what you need. Now, that might be a typical thing. Like typically you like me to do this, but you know what? I still say, please share. What do you need? What do you need? Et cetera. Tell me, what do you think about that? I do. I, although, although the first time we do approach one idea differently, I am sympathetic to the wife of 20 years who feels invisible and unknown to her husband. Yes. If now, and there's a caveat there. If she has explained to the best of her ability, yes, many, many, many times that mm -hmm. this thing hurts me, that this behavior yes. or this incident, I am really sympathetic to that. And, and it, I, I understand how, how small and unimportant a human being can feel when it's like, <laughs> when that's the response from their head. It's so many husbands I talk to, it's like, I don't know what to do. And I'm like, do you understand that that condition is in itself offensive to your wife, that after two decades together, you're not sure what sort of gifts she would like for her anniversary. You're not sure, like, yeah, like all these things. And yes, that, I that agree. And I want to say, I agree with you on that. There's like, there are nuances, of yeah, course, in this. again, it's not so black and white, but if you're going through something unique, let's say you've been married for 15 years and your one of your parent your parent dies. You've never gone through that before. You might not know what you need, and your partner may not know what. You, like your wife, she, what the heck? She was she was in grief for almost a year. When we go through something unusual, it is our job to share. Like you know, I really need help with this, and it's our partner's job to show up and say, "I've got you." More than anything, as a human being, I want to know that that person I'm in relationship with has me, has my back knows that no matter what, I may not understand, like you said, or agree with you, but man, I've got you, you can yeah. lean on me. And that's when we can be vulnerable. Intimacy improves. I mean, we, talk, we can get into sex talk, but it's like sexual relationships improve when you feel like you can trust that person and they've got you. That's right. Yeah. Do I have a couple of minutes to talk yeah, about? Go. Well, so many guys going back to validation, they don't know mechanically how to validate because to them, I've had so many guys say this to me. So many guys say, Matt, it sounds like you're advocating just agreeing with your wife. You know, the whole like mm. happy wife, happy life thing. They're like, but I don't agree with my wife. In these moments where you're yeah. asking me to change my habits, I, I don't know how to do that because it violates my sense of, you know, intelligence and justice. Yeah. And that's where I'm like, guys, you're conflating the idea of agreement and validation. They're not the same. So I offer this thought exercise that circles back to what you were just talking about, about, about having your back, being safe with somebody. Yeah. And the, the example I offer is the thought exercise I personally used to overcome my invalidation habit. I don't know how I thought of it. I just did. And I, I don't know. I, I, please challenge it if you think it's silly. Oh, let's hear it. But I, I refer to it as the monster under the bed theory. And I imagine my son wakes up in the middle of the night. He's 13 years old today, so he's not doing this, but he used to be four. And when he was four, he was a threat to wake up at one or two in the morning, freaking out hysterically because he was afraid of a monster under his bed. And if I am operating on my default setting 10 years ago, I walk into that room, I ascertain he's upset because of a monster under a bed. That's why he's crying. That's why he's feeling fear. And my inclination is to try to convince him there isn't a monster under the bed. Yeah. And, 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 and in that disagreement about what he believes versus what I believe, I'm going to try to sell him 
I'm going to try to like win the battle of ideas with him. That's my methodology yeah. for fixing yeah. the situation. I'm going to be like, dude, there isn't a monster under the bed. You're being, you know, you're, you're totally overreacting. There's, you're wrong. There's no monster. And so, and, and I might say something really gross, like, you know, toughen up. There's no monster. You know, I might do the like, boys don't cry thing. Like go to sleep. Everything's fine. And, and I, I tell every client that I work with, I think there's some really important facts to pull away from that. One is if there was like a courtroom official in the room, a judge, he or she might say, dad's right. Like dad wins the like factual argument here. Mm -hmm. So you can be right. And I can love my son, love him more than I love anything. And I cannot try to hurt my son. In this moment where I'm saying these things, I am not actively trying to harm him. Mm -hmm. I just believe that's what I might have said to him on my default setting a decade ago. And it would not have been to hurt him. It would have been my methodology to sell him on the idea that he believes something that isn't real and he shouldn't. But I like to think about it like this. What's the math result of what I just did? The math result after I leave that room is that my son's still afraid. My son's still sad. He's probably still crying. Only this time he's alone in the dark. And he just learned that if he tries to recruit dad to help him with something and dad doesn't think the thing rises to the level of importance that, that, that I do as this, you know, scared person in bed, mm -hmm. then dad abandons me literally or metaphorically to cry alone in the dark. And I'm going to trust dad just a little bit less now. And if this is how dad always shows up every time something hurts me and I share that out loud, and then dad comes back at me with some, something that suggests I'm being weak or I'm incorrect or I'm crazy for believing what I believe or feeling what I feel, I'm going to lose trust. I'm, I'm not necessarily going to not love my dad. I'm not necessarily going to believe he doesn't love me, but he's not going to have my trust anymore. And he's not included anymore. When I grow up and I'm offered drugs or I'm getting bullied or whatever's going on in my teenage years that my dad might want to know about, he doesn't get to know because he's not a safe place mm -hmm. to go with the things that are affecting me, that are hurting me. And so what's the, what's the better way? What's the emotionally healthy way to show up for my son? Mm -hmm. And I believe it's, I hear my son crying. I run up to the room. I open the door. I find out he's afraid of a monster in the bed. But instead of hyper-focusing on whether there is or is not some scary thing there, all I care about is that my son is afraid. And I want to sit on the bed and I want to hug him. And I'd be like, but I'm not sure there's a monster under the bed, but I can see that you're afraid right now. And I've been afraid before. And it is so awful. And I'm so sorry that you're feeling that right now. That's a really, really terrible thing to feel. Let's turn the light on. Let's look under the bed. Let's make sure there's no monster there. And then full circle to like what you closed with just now is the idea of being alone versus having someone's back, being there for someone. The thing I would want to say to my son today is, buddy, I just want you to know when things hurt, when you're afraid, when something's wrong, you can call mom, you can call dad. And we're always going to show up for you. And we might not be able to fix what's broken. We might not be able to write what's wrong, but you never have to face these things alone. You never have to feel like you're the only one like battling whatever awful thing it is that you're battling. And that galvanizes humans and that maintains and or grows trust in a relationship. And I hope for anybody that might be listening that struggles with validation in a relationship, they can see the parallel to our adult relationship. When we focus on being right, we are a threat to erode trust, even when we're right, even when we love, even when we don't intend to harm. But when we hyper-focus instead on just relating on a healthy emotional level and empathizing and learning how to like show up in a nuanced way so that the math result of behavior is not, I'm right at your expense and I don't care about how you feel, but no matter what, I'm there and you never, even if I can't fix it, you never have to be alone. And this awful thing that you're going through, I wish I'd given that to my wife. That would have absolutely changed the world. If all of the time she hurt, she didn't crave my agreement. She craved me caring about her. And that nuanced idea of you feel this way and that must be awful and I'm really sorry. And I'm going to do anything I can to participate moving forward in you not feeling that way. And even if I, there's nothing I can do, at the very least, you don't have to feel like you're the only one because mm -hmm. I'm here. And I, I, I just think that is really an important idea where there's two, it's neither, neither thing's bad. You're not a bad man. You're not a bad father. You're not a bad parent. Um, if you go into the room and you talk to like your child that way and that hypothetical, mm -hmm. I just believe one way erodes trust and one way doesn't. And I, I just think we should choose the one that 
maintain safety and trust in the relationship if we value togetherness. Oh, I love, I love everything you said. I'm so glad that you don't. So think beautiful. That's okay, it go. really is. It's not again. It's 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 not about being right. It's being there in it with that person, be, whoever it is. And I love that you spoke about your son because what you do in relationship with your partner, again, husband, wife, whomever it is, is the kids see, the kids are feeling the energy, the kids are learning. How do you show up with your kids? It's like, what are you modeling? I love this because that's a great example about the monster under the bed for your son too. Because as parents, I think we fall into the role of like fixing them, (laughs) you know, this is the way that what you're saying is not true. This is how you should do it. Instead of being with them in it. So thank you for bringing that up. Cause I think this is really, this is just the way healthy humans live. It's being in your adult chair, honestly. It's just, <laughs> this is how healthy, emotionally healthy adults should show up. So thank you. You're really setting a benchmark for people out there in the world. This is really just a great, great book. Everybody needs to read this book. Thank you really, so much. I, so the I, question I, is, people are listening to this right now. What, what can I do if I'm listening to this going, oh God, I got to change my relationship. I, I need to show up differently. What can someone do right now to change how they're showing up in relationships? I, I don't want to repeat myself and, and go redirect no. me anytime you want, but no. me, the low hanging fruit, if, and I believe, I believe this invalidation problem exists in in the statistical majority of relationships at yeah. least some of the time yep i mean to me that's the low-hanging fruit is yeah. i'm not going to invalidate like Perfect. i'm not going to do that i'm going to what i'm going to do and i think maybe a, a clearer way to think about it is to have successful conversations yep somebody either partner should be able to go to the other in a healthy relationship and say hey something is adversely affecting me and the results of that conversation should be the other person saying, oh, wow, you're experiencing something bad. And because I love you, I want to understand it. And to whatever extent I can participate in you not feeling that bad thing anymore, I'm going to. And that's just not what we do. And and not because we don't like our partners or not because we crave like their pain somehow. It's just this habitual disagreement. It's, It's this thoughtless, careless conversation habit that we have. Well, we really and, think that we're helping or at minimum not causing harm. But no, we have to and, learn how to see the pain, learn how to see the harm. I, I love I believe that. That's the, that's but what do you do if you're triggered? I'm thinking of some of my clients. I'm like, okay, what if someone is really triggered by what their partner is saying and they can't do what you're saying? What do you do then? I would refer them to somebody smarter than me, a clinician. I'm just a guy that like tries to help people think about these things in a slightly different way than they've been thinking about them before. And I'm just saying, I don't know that I have prescriptive advice for that. So if you and I are in a relationship and you, and you come to me or I come to you and I go, Oh my gosh, Matt, this happened to me. And da 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 da. And maybe I say something like, um, you know, the way your father talked to me when we were at dinner with him a week ago was really rude and I don't like it. So I might be saying something to you that's triggering because it's your dad. Yeah. So how then, what do you say to somebody then that like, how, how are you going to come and be with me in this and really hear me because it's your dad and that's might be triggering you. Yeah, no, that, that, that requires a lot of growth. I mean, to me, to me, I, I don't, if there's a light switch methodology for switching from somebody who reacts, how I used to react to somebody who I hope I would yeah. react to that in an appropriate way. I'm still, I'd still be a threat to defend my father, like in that situation yeah. today. I mean, I have to really do the work, um, but I, I, I really believe I would disassociate my feelings about it in the same way I disassociate my opinion about whether there is or is not something worthy of being, you know, my son being afraid of the monster thing. I, yeah. That's what I keep coming back to in these conversations with like the guys that I'm working with is j- just keep remembering when we try to argue about whether the monster's there or not, we inadvertently erode trust in our relationship. And yeah. when we don't worry at all about whether the monster's there, I mean, hypothetically, if there was actually a monster there, everybody understands there'd be a problem and we'd have yes. to be yeah. there. But, but yeah. within the framework of there isn't a monster and a child is afraid of something that isn't real or isn't there, I should say. It's real to them in a fear way. I, I care 
that my relationship partner experienced pain. And I don't need to get, I don't need to defend my father because he didn't try to cause harm. I, I might need to have a conversation with him about bingo. boundaries and bingo, things like bingo, that. Bingo, bingo, bingo. Right? That was, that was good. Yeah. So I got to back her up, it, but, but I have to understand it first. I mean, the first thing I would do is try to, it's like, uh, dad said something to you and it doesn't make any sense to me that you'd feel bad about it. Help me understand why that, th the truth is today, I think if I was in a room with a relationship partner and my dad did say something, mm -hmm. I think I'd know. That, that's the difference. So yeah. the people who don't recognize it, I think are a threat to invalidate and not show up for their partners effectively. Yeah. And the people that are in tune with their partners and yeah. vigilantly consider it, of how as life's happening, they might be feeling about it. I think those people will recognize in real time what's going on. But you even, don't have to fight with yeah. your father. You can just have a private conversation with it, them later exactly. in the spirit of backing up your wife. Ex yes, who, in the spirit partner, of backing up your wife or your husband, like whoever, yeah. Yeah, whoever, you know, whoever sure. it is that you're in a relationship with. But um, it's remembering that your partner comes first, you know, your marriage, your, your husband, your wife, your girlfriend, boyfriend, and then I like that though. It's just really validating that even if you don't agree, and I know you've said this many different ways today, but I think it's hugely important. You validate, even if you don't agree, even if you think that person's crazy, you are yeah. still validating because it says I'm there with you, even though, even though I might not, and you don't say to them, I may not agree with you, but right. you're just being there with them, which helps to build the trust and build safety. And that can change a whole relationship. So if I'm thinking about people listening, saying, I really got to change this, this relationship I'm in. You just offered some beautiful tools today to do that. And it is about trust and safety. Yes, it really is. So, yeah, I mean, I think, I, I think safety is at the root of why the relationships I'm focused on, I'm sure it's everybody really, mm -hmm. but I'm, again, I'm just focused on those people that, that aren't doing things that like are overtly harmful, that, that don't seem like visibly obvious. It's yeah. these nuanced ways in which we erode trust in our blind spots. Yeah. I, I just think safety is so critical to think about there. I think it's easy to understand why somebody who's physically violent or a criminal or, yeah. an, or an, even like an addict, even yeah. somebody that isn't like awful, but has like something that's a threat to like harm the relationship, how this feeling of safety can go away. But I think a lot of men that are like, I get up every day and I'm a, I perceive myself to be a good husband and a good father and I go to work and I don't cheat and I don't lie and I truly love my wife very much. And everybody seems to like me and think I'm a great guy. She's the only person that ever complains about me. Like that's the guy that yeah. inadvertently erodes trust in his blind spots because yes. he can't make the like logical connection. Um, to your point about not agreeing, in the chapter in the book in which I go into like the monster into the bed scenario, I open that chapter, if I'm remembering right, with this scenario where you get a phone call. I'm like, imagine you get a phone call and you pick it up and a person on the other end identifies themselves as law enforcement. And they say, we're so sorry, but someone you love, and they say the name of like your best friend or a family member or somebody has passed. There's been an accident and they're oh. gone. And you're like, and so maybe there's like an hour or two, they ask you to come down and identify the body in the morgue. And this thing I made up and you get there and there's all these people standing around and they pull the sheet back. And then that person who you thought was dead for two hours jumps off the bed and laughs at you because everybody had like gotten together to pull this prank on you. And I just think it's important to think about, it doesn't matter always what's true. People can experience really, really awful things inside them. Yeah. Even when something didn't happen, and I, I, I like the extremeness of believing somebody had died and going through the shock and the grief. It's really dark. I mean, I don't yeah. think people should do this in real life, but yeah. I think when we like play it out in our heads, it's easy to understand that, yeah, we would feel like somebody died, even if they hadn't. And can we just have like the emotional wherewithal to apply that even to things that present way, way smaller than that, like a dish by the sink, laundry on the floor, toilet seats being left in a certain position. Yeah. You know, the decision to grab a cup of coffee at Starbucks and not text your partner to say, hey, would you like anything when you yeah. get home with your drink and they feel a little bad that you forgot them. Like yeah. these are the small things that erode trust in relationships. And you might calculate that that's not as big of a deal or not as harmful 
But I just encourage people to remember that it doesn't matter whether the monster's there. It doesn't matter whether your friend died or didn't die. You can still feel yeah. like somebody passed. Your child or your whoever can still feel the same level of fear as if there really were a monster under the bed. And so if we want trust with that person, how we respond to that is everything. So you've talked a lot about empathy and I agree. Do you feel like you can teach someone empathy? Do you coach men on how to be more empathetic? I, I, I think there's probably some nuances within yeah. like mental and emotional health that, yeah. that I don't understand. That, but, but the way that I would try to do it, I think is just to do those like perspective shift, like thought exercises. Mm-hmm. And I often ask, you know, when's the last time you thought about crying or you felt afraid? or you were really angry, or just anything, at any point in your life, can you recall a time in which you experienced this? And, and, and most of the time, people have a story. It, yeah. It's scary when they don't. Then, yeah. you know, you worry about, like, sociopathy and things like that. And again, definitely not qualified to, like, help yeah. anybody with something like that. I mean, everybody has the ability to feel emotions, I, I believe. We all have the ability. The problem, again, with humans is that if we weren't raised in households where we are directing our attention and our awareness back to self and to those emotions, we don't really know how to do it. It's like, it's like saying, Hey, go speak French. It's like, well, I've never spoken French. How do I speak French? We'll just do it. It's like there it's, it's a slow process. So I want to say to people listening, I believe that if there's a will, there's always a way and learning even just to tune in when someone's, when, when you're sitting with your partner um, and they're having an experience, tune in and get curious about what's happening in your body when they're having their emotion or the, when they're sharing their story. Even you might notice a very slight knot in your stomach or, or not in your throat, just start tuning in. And that will then start helping you to tune into your own emotions. You might not even be able to label that it's sadness or grief or whatever. You're going to start noticing, I'm feeling it in my body. Many people feel, feel it in their body first, and then they start to be able to articulate oh, it's this. I got it now. So just a little food for thought. Yeah. The the way I think I would specifically talk to a guy struggling with anyone, but, but, but again, it's almost always men on the other side of these conversations from me is we get stuck in our heads about whether there's a monster there or not. Yeah. And since we don't believe it, we're like, it doesn't make sense to feel fear when our wives or girlfriends or whoever partners come to us and they say, this thing happened and it hurt me, our brains say, well, that doesn't hurt. Like that incident doesn't hurt. And I ask them to reverse engineer it a little bit. I say, okay, can you just identify the emotion that they're having? Is it anger? Is it fear? Is it sadness? And can you just relate on that level? And that's why I ask, like, can you remember an incident in which you felt insert bad emotion, negative, I don't want to say bad, a negative feeling emotion here, something that's unpleasant for you. Mm-hmm. And so you remember being sad? Okay, well, right now your partner is sad because of this thing that happened. And if you can just care that she is experiencing that thing that you remember that's so awful to feel yeah. and, and just deal with that rather than getting hung up on whether she should or shouldn't feel it. I, I don't know like to what extent you'd co with that idea, but to me, mechanically, no, I like that, that is how I think about trying to relate to somebody where, where I just, I'm not having the same organic experience they're having. Yeah. It's so important to me that they not feel abandoned while they're having it. That's the key not to abandon them in that experience. This is such good stuff. Thank you. Thank you. You, um, so where would people find you and what, what do you offer programs, anything like that? Share with the audience, like all your things. I, we talked about, we talked in this conversation about the things that I talk about and coaching conversations, and I would never come on your show and suggest that people should be working with me when they're listening to you. They should probably be working with you. If you're, are you, you are actively coaching today. Do yes. I, oh, do I still see clients one-on-one? Are you, are you still seeing no, clients? No, I don't. Ha- I just, no, I don't. Okay. I, then I feel less guilty about it. No, okay. I well, have my attention. I have a coaching certification and a membership. Yeah. I have a bunch of other things that I. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Then, cause I didn't, I wasn't going to like 
hawk no, my I, coaching service. Hey, I think you should service. toot your horn and really own. Let me let me invite you, Mr. Mr. Matt Frey, to own your stuff because you're very good. So no, that's really let me coach you right now. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. <laughs> like own it, man. Like you've got good stuff here. People uh, should totally sign up. And what do you offer? Coaching? Yes, we we do it via Zoom most of the time, sometimes by phone and as as few or as many as the person derives value from. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah, I would never want anybody to talk to me if, if they didn't find it useful. But yeah, yeah. A, a lot of the people I talk to do find it useful. And I imagine some do not. And we don't talk after that. And that's fine. I'm not probably for everyone. But for anybody who showed up in their relationship or actively shows up the way that I write about, the way that I talk about, we tend to have a lot in common. And so my path to like today is useful for them. Mm -hmm. They try to like emulate, like that same path can sometimes be useful for them. Yeah. Um, my home on the internet is simply matthewfray.com. That's Matthew with two T's. Mm -hmm. And my book just released in North America on March 22nd, six days ago, which is really exciting. It was the first time anything like that had happened. Um, this is how your marriage ends. And then we release in the United Kingdom on March 31st. And then some other countries coming up like Germany and the Netherlands and Italy. What about Australia? Very exciting. It might be in Australia. On March on 31st now. as well. Okay, good. I'm not 100% certain. I, I, I would have to confirm with the publisher. Okay. But I do know that Australia was included in awesome. that business relationship with that publisher. Awesome. Good. Because I, I read the book and I think it's a great book. People need to read this book. It's a good one. Thank you. It's really All great. right. So we're going to add your website to the show notes. And on there, they will find if they do want to coach with you, they can go to your website and find Absolutely. that as well. And the book is on, is it on Amazon or just on your website? It's everywhere books are sold. Awesome. Yeah. Everyone needs to go do that. Thank you so much, Matt, for being with us today. This was a great conversation. And um, yeah, thanks for all you're doing for the mostly men in the world, but everybody in the world. Yeah. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you.